to give a little background of this lecture, several years ago, I was asked to uh, give a lecture to a paramedic program uh, regarding kind of OB and GYN, and they gave me the textbook slides and said, here you go. And there were about 130 to 150 slides of which the vast majority dealt with uh, kind of fetal anatomy and development and then sexually transmitted infections or diseases. And there was virtually nothing on the type of OB emergencies that you guys see in the field. Uh, on top of kind of seeing what was taught in paramedic school, I also saw at the hospital, a, a lot of patients coming in who were pregnant came by EMS and there were a number of different complicating factors. And so it really made me realize that we needed to do a better job providing education to you guys in terms of what you're gonna actually see in the field and see if we can improve that. Uh, I work at Banner Thunderbird in the emergency department, a very similar emergency department to Desert, uh, same service lines in terms of trauma, peds, and OB. Uh, and so we see a lot of the same type of patient populations. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to interrupt at any point and ask questions. Uh, I should be able to tell now, uh, we had some practice yesterday. If someone's trying to join, you may just see me uh, admit them to the meeting itself, um, but that's gonna be kind of the main issue with that. So in terms of continuous quality improvement, uh, all calls uh, discussed in this lecture are considered high risk. Um, many of these calls may not have good outcomes and that's just unfortunately what we term the nature of the beast. Uh, what that means is that the outcome uh, may not have been a good one, but there's nothing that we could have necessarily done to prevent that. Uh, part of the CQI process is we really wanna make sure that all conversations are protected. Uh, and the reason for that is anything that's discussed in this is kind of part of the CQI process and is protected from discovery in a, basically in a courtroom. If we were to discuss these cases in a more casual setting, that conversation could potentially be discoverable. So a little bit about the CQI process. So this is something that I've really worked hard to establish it with the different agencies that I work with. And it's something that we're working on uh, doing here in Mesa as well. And really to me, CQI is what guides our training and education. So one of the things that we saw in kind of development of this lecture was a number of OB cases that came by EMS where there was really an opportunity for us to provide better education. And so that was really the genesis of this lecture as well. I really always try to make sure that everyone recognizes from a CQI perspective, if there's not field personnel in the room, we probably shouldn't be doing that. And that's really important for me. Uh, the rationale for this is you guys are the ones in the field, you know, different apartment complexes, nursing homes, and why there might be a delay from when you first get on scene to when you actually make patient contact. You also have the insight of if you're on a big car rack, uh, things that may have affected the extrication or delayed patient access. And so those pieces from a field perspective are really critical. So anytime I do CQI, I always wanna make sure that there's someone from the field participating, if not several people to help make sure that we have a good perspective. Uh, the other part just to mention as well, is C as I said before, CQI for me is really a training uh, tool. It's how we gauge what we train on, but really my role within the department is to help with training and education. Uh, I definitely have no disciplinary role within the department, and I always tell people if I'm in the room, this is not disciplinary. My goal is to always have people be successful and maintain their certification, and that's really my job is to provide the training that you guys need. So how are pregnant patients different? Well, typically when I do this lecture, I make people participate, uh, a little harder to do virtually, uh, but obviously the key thing is that there's two patients. We always have to think about both patients. Uh, and the really big difficulty is that in the pre-hospital setting, uh, you guys don't have a great way to monitor fetal well-being. So you don't have an ultrasound or Doppler. You have no way to check the fetal heart tones to see if the baby is doing okay. Uh, one, the best way to kind of make sure that the baby is safe is number one, make sure that mom's vitals are normal. So if mom's hypotensive, then that means the baby's not being perfused either. So definitely making sure that the mom's getting adequate fluid resuscitation. But the really key thing that you guys can ask about after about 20 to 22 weeks is are you feeling the baby move? And that's really the best indicator pre-hospital that you can use to gauge fetal well-being. So recognizing that that's just a really easy question to ask about the mom, especially if she's over 22 weeks, are you feeling the baby move? Is the baby moving normally that you would feel at this time of day? Uh, typically a pregnant woman are able to tell you that, yes, I felt the baby move during this pregnancy or no, I haven't yet. And then that will help you gauge the fetal well-being. So honor of Halloween, typically I give this lecture uh, every year in, uh, in October or some variation. So I always got to throw a little Halloween humor in there. So I like to have one slide in the lecture for people to remember. So this is the one slide that I would ask 
anytime you encounter a pregnant patient, regardless of their chief complaint, if they're greater than 20 weeks gestation, these are the questions that I want you to ask. Are you having any vaginal bleeding, loss of fluids, contractions? Are you feeling the baby move, any abdominal pain and any neuro signs or symptoms? Uh, we'll get into some specific cases about neuro signs and symptoms, but obviously the main thing we worry about with this is preeclampsia. So again, kind of the one key slide, if this is the only thing you remember from today is to recognize that regardless of chief complaint, even if she's complaining of chest pain or difficulty breathing, if she's greater than 20 weeks, we wanna make sure we ask these questions as well. So I'm gonna briefly go through some definitions and statistics and then kind of help hopefully lead us into the case discussion. So describing pregnancy. So this is something that seems pretty basic, but I often find needs a little bit more explanation. So there's gravita, which is the total number of pregnancies, and para, which is the number of live births. Uh, SAB is the abbreviation for spontaneous abortion, and this is a medical term for miscarriage. Uh, the really important thing that I've learned in my clinical practice is to ask patients, how many pregnancies have you had? How many live births? And then I always follow up with, have you had any miscarriages? Uh, the reason I follow up in that order is that many women, uh, if they have had a miscarriage or multiple miscarriages, this is upsetting to them and they don't consider that part of their normal pregnancy history. But for you guys, this may be really important. If you've got a patient who's a G6, P1, and she's had four miscarriages, that's a much higher risk pregnancy because she's already had four miscarriages. So recognizing that asking that additional information is really helpful. Uh, so like you see here, this example, you could describe a patient, she's 32 weeks, G3, P1, SAB1, meaning she's had three pregnancies, one live birth, one miscarriage, and she's now currently pregnant. Uh, if someone has their first pregnancy, it's considered G1, P0. So G1, this is their first pregnancy, P0, they've not yet had a live birth. So pregnancy dating. So typically what is used is the first day of the last menstrual cycle in early ultrasound. And this is kind of the most frequent uh, early use for dating a, a patient's pregnancy. Uh, one of the difficulties with utilizing this is that relies on the mother having a very uh, regular cycle of every 28 days. And if she has any irregularity to her menstrual cycle, a due date based on LMP can actually be uh, plus or minus two weeks on either side of it, which means you have a four week window, uh, which is really significant when we get into viability of babies. Uh, so one of the big things is if you get a due date from a mom, so if she says, yes, I'm getting prenatal care and she can give you the due date, that's something that her OB doctor has utilized either ultrasound, last menstrual cycle or a combination of the two to come up with the most accurate due date. Uh, so really important just to make sure that if you do have a due date, you wanna use that information. Uh, one of the key things is to use a pregnancy wheel. Uh, there's lots of apps on your phone. Many of them are free. Uh, this one I was told is no longer free or available anymore, but if you just search uh, pregnancy wheel on your app uh, on your phone, there's multiple different ones that you can get for free. The nice thing about these apps is that you can program in the patient's LMP or due date and will automatically calculate to today what that patient's gestation is in weeks and days. So when you're giving a report to the hospital, this is really helpful. So it definitely, if you know, if the patient knows the, uh, their due date, that's the best thing to use for that. So weeks are also really important and I'll show you some very specific examples. So many times patients will say, I'm five months pregnant, six months pregnant, uh, but the difficulty is that a month time frame is a really big variable window of time. And if you look at this, five months could be 18 to 21 weeks. As I'm sure most of you guys are aware, to go to OB versus the ED is a very strict 20 week cutoff. If they're 19, days and six, uh, 19 weeks and six days, that patient stays in the ED. But once they hit the 20 week mark, that's when a patient would go to OB directly. And so knowing the number of weeks is really critical. So this is a nice breakdown that gets into weeks gestation versus months. And I think it helps to demonstrate why we might ask you some more questions in the patch phone when you're calling in to determine what we need to know. So five weeks, just uh, five months is gonna be 18 to 21 weeks. And then six months is 22 to 26 weeks. When we look at viability, especially in this 22 to 26 week window, this is where there's a huge variation. Uh, 26 weeks is an absolutely viable baby. 22 weeks is typically not. And so there's a high var variability with that. So if we say that someone is six months, uh, that is gonna be a little bit problematic in terms of whether or not this patient, uh, the baby has a chance of survival. So a couple things in pregnancy exams. So number one, you wanna perform your standard exam, uh, palpate the abdomen. So one of the things that's really helpful with pregnant women is to kind of feel what a normal pregnant uh, abdomen uterus feels like. 
uh, when the uterus contracts, you'll feel the abdominal wall contract with the uterus. Uh, there's some conditions, specifically placental abruption, and we'll talk about how that's a little bit different in terms of what you actually see on exam and can feel on exam. So definitely uh, getting used to what a normal contraction should feel like on a pregnant woman. Uh, looking for leg swelling, obviously that would be a sign of preeclampsia. If the patient tells you she needs to push or describes bleeding, you have to take off her pants and look. Uh, I always laugh in the emergency department, we'll get an alarm room, uh, notification for an imminent delivery, or we'll hear the crew patch in and there's sirens in the background, clearly come in code three, and the patient arrives and she's got the tightest maternity stretch pants still on. So the only thing that that's doing is kind of holding the baby in. Uh, so just a reminder that I uh, want to make sure that you actually uh, kind of do take a look at the patient says she's bleeding or has an urge to push. So imminent delivery, I think you guys probably do a better job in the field than we do in the hospital with this. So this is really key to determine, is this patient actively pushing? So uh, in the hospital, we're, we need to know where does this patient go? Are they going to OB triage or labor and delivery? Or do they have to stop in the emergency department because they're not going to make it there? And so that's the really important thing to differentiate. How does this patient look? So if she's actively pushing, pulling her legs up, grabbing the sides of the gurney, uh, grunting or crowning, those are all signs of an imminent delivery. Uh, what's not an imminent delivery would be someone who's saying their water broke, they're having contractions without active pushing, or they're texting on their cell phone, they're letting all their family members know, hey, I'm in labor, I'm on my way to the hospital. That's someone who's in labor, they may not be necessarily an imminent delivery. So periviable births. So by definition, a periviable birth is any delivery that occurs between 20 weeks and zero days and 25 weeks and six days. Um, we'll go into some specifics on uh, survival and you definitely don't need to kind of know or memorize this graph, but just to understand that when we use the term periviable birth, that's the weeks of gestation that we're referring to. So chances of survival and weeks of gestation. So this is what's really important. So if you look at less than 21 weeks, you have zero chance of survival. At 22 weeks, it's zero to 10%. At 23 weeks, 10 to 35%. When we get to 24 weeks, that's when we start seeing a pretty big variation of anywhere from 40 to 70%. At 25 weeks, 50 to 80%. And then again, at that 26 week mark, you're at least 80% and, and up. So again, if someone says that they are six months pregnant, that gives you this whole window, which is 22 weeks. So zero to 10% all the way to 80 to 90%. And you can recognize very easily how a six month time frame is going to give you a high variability in survivability. So this is why we are we probably would ask for either a due date or a week's gestation if you're calling in about the patient. So what are some factors affecting survival? So the two main factors affecting survival are the number of weeks that baby is in the uterus. So this is their gestational age. So essentially how many weeks were they in the uterus and able to help develop and grow at the time of birth and also their weight at the time of delivery. So those two factors combined to be the most important factors for influencing fetal development and survival. Uh, there's high variability with this. So one example would be a mom who's had really good prenatal care, she's been eating everything she's supposed to be, you know, following up with her doctor. She develops, uh, she delivers a baby at 25 weeks. Even though that baby's early, if she's been doing everything well, the baby's weight may actually be a decent weight for that gestational age. You may contrast that to a woman who's 27 weeks along. She's been using methamphetamines, not using drugs, not getting prenatal care. Even though she may be a further uh, gestational age, if that baby's weight is lower, which would likely be at that point due to the drug use, that baby would have a lower chance of survival. So again, the combination of number of weeks in the uterus at the time of delivery and the weight are really gonna be what affects survival. So other factors that also improve survival for premature delivery includes uh, the sex of the baby. So female preemies tend to do better than males. Uh, plurality, so the OB uses uh, some funny terms, singleton, which is just a normal one uh, baby delivery. Uh, obviously one baby is gonna have a higher chance of survival than multiple gestation pregnancy. And again, that gets into size. If you think about triplets or quadruplets, they're always gonna typically be smaller in size uh, because they're sharing the resources that uh, they get by the placenta. So again, uh, single birth versus multiple gestation is gonna have a higher delivery rate, I'm sorry, higher survival rate. 
pre-delivery steroid administration. So this is really important. Uh, many patients who have preterm labor or have preeclampsia, one of the key uh, metrics that helps that baby's long-term outcome is for mom to get a shot of steroids. And they find that if mom can get one or ideally two doses of steroids uh, prior to that baby being born, the steroids help with that lung development. And this is a significant uh, impact on the baby's long-term uh, lung health and ultimately their outcome. So again, that post-delivery care and pre-delivery care are really critical. Uh, Post-delivery care, we'll get into this a little bit at the end. And this talks about kind of where that baby's born. So what resources are available at the hospital with that, where that baby is born? And this is why we have the different levels of NICUs and kind of try to get the patient hopefully to the ideal setting uh, prior to delivery. So a little bit about birth weight criteria, again, not numbers that you guys need to know, but just to give you an idea in terms of how difficult it would be to resuscitate some babies depending on their size. So if you think about it as a low birth weight is considered less than five pounds, eight ounces, very low birth weight is less than three pounds, five ounces, and extremely low birth weight is less than two pounds, three ounces. So we're gonna go briefly through uh, some fetal development. And the reason I'm gonna show you these pictures is to really help you guys identify which are babies that if you see born in the pre-hospital setting, you would need to resuscitate or not resuscitate. Uh, so at week seven is where you first start to see the development of eyes. By week nine is where you see some develop, developing eye lobe and the eyes, eyes become a little bit more clear. Uh, by week 13, you see more basic facial features in place. The key thing in the second trimester is looking at the skin development. And I don't know if any of you guys have seen a pre-viable baby born in the pre-hospital setting. If you have, you'll probably recognize that they have a very sticky translucent or transparent skin. And I'll show you some pictures of that. The reason I'm teaching you that is that's the key thing that will help you differentiate whether this is a preterm uh, baby or not. So hair development occurs about week 22, uh, as well as the ability of opening eyes at week 26. And so some of these are really the key factors that we look at to determine whether or not this baby is viable. Uh, development of fat, which you start seeing at week 26, and really what you see throughout the third trimester. Uh, anything in the third trimester is really just that baby's opportunity to get bigger in size, grow and put on weight, and all those factors improve their outcome. So again, anything born in the th in third trimester is definitely survivable. Uh, the main thing is this is just their ability to kind of fatten up and become a healthier baby before they're born. So these are some uh, national recommendations here in the US for resuscitation. And again, nothing you, you guys need to know, but just for informational purposes. So pretty much in the 23 week time frame, they will offer resuscitation, but discourage it due to long-term complications. In the 24 week time frame, they will offer resuscitation and encourage it. And basically once they hit 25 weeks, full resuscitation is initiated. And so really the key thing to probably know from this is that at a minimum, anything 25 weeks or above, regardless, if, if you're told that's the week's gestation, you would wanna do full resuscitation on that baby. So that's all great. So if you had a mom that is getting prenatal care, she tells you her due date, you're able to use an app on your phone, you calculate weeks gestation, you know exactly what to do. Unfortunately, as I'm sure you guys know in the pre-hospital setting, that's probably not what you guys see a lot. Uh, you'll get on scene, you have a mom who tells you I'm pregnant, I haven't had any prenatal care, I think I'm due in May, and you ask them how they got that. I don't know, I just kind of think that's my time frame that I'm due. Or you look at her and you'll go, she looks like she's probably near term gestation, but you have no definitive information. So this is something that I think is really common, unfortunately, in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, many of these women lack resources to get to the hospital on their own. So they will typically call 911 when they're in labor or having complications. And so you guys are the first step in medical care who are trying to determine what do you do with mom and potentially a baby who's born that's pre-viable. There are key external features that are gonna indicate that a baby is pre-viable. And I'm gonna show you some very specific pictures of this, but I think the two easiest ones to look at, look for are transparent or translucent skin and fused eyelids. So the fused eyelids meaning that there's eyes that are very uh, obviously visible, but they do not open yet. A lack of lanugo, and I'll show you some pictures of that as well as imperceptible breast tissue. So this is a scoring system that the neonatal uh, team uses to very quickly, uh, they will be able to look at a baby and know what their gestational age is by doing a quick mental calculation. Again, nothing you guys need to memorize or know, uh, but just kind of recognizing all the factors that I'm gonna point out here. So lack of lanugo, sticky, friable, transparent skin, imperceptible breast tissue, 
uh, genitalia that's hard to determine. All those are indicative um, that a baby is gonna be very uh, low maturity rating, so low gestational age in weeks. Uh, you'll see in some of these pictures as well, limb positioning also uh, affects their the gestational age. And so those are some of the things that the neonatal team will use. And they will quickly look at a baby that's born and be able to kind of do a mountain calculation and know this is how far along that baby is. So this baby is 19 weeks gestation. Uh, you can see here uh, definite facial features, uh, but the eyes are fused. Uh, if you look at the breast uh, area, you can kind of see imperceptible breast tissue. There's not an obvious nipple noted there. Again, 21 weeks when we're talking about some of those pictures with limb positioning. So definitely the face is more uh, developed, uh, but the eyes are still fused. Uh, kind of giving you a gauge in size, 10.5 inches. I'm not sure why they throw the carrot in. I know a lot of people like to throw in fruits and vegetables in social media, but there's lots of different size carrots, just like there's lots of different size fruits and vegetables, but probably the number is the more uh, important thing to look at. So another identification of 21 weeks, again, definitely looks like a baby, but if you're trying to figure out, do you resuscitate this baby or not? you'll see the eyelids are fused, there's imperceptible breast tissue, hard to discern if this is a male or female gender. And then you see this really sticky, transparent, kind of translucent skin. So these are the really classic findings that will help you identify that this is a pre-viable infant. Uh, these babies are gonna be tiny. And so if you look at a baby that's born this size, you're gonna recognize your ability to resuscitate this baby is, is basically zero. There's just no way you would physically be able to do that. Uh, 22 weeks, again, you start to see the facial features a little bit more developed, but again, genitalia may be a little bit more clear, but not definitive. Uh, eyes are still fused and imperceptible breast tissue, but again, that very classic presentation to the skin. So I'm going to move on to lanugo. So lanugo is a very thin uh, downy type hair that covers the entire body. So extremely premature infants, as we saw in those last few pictures, do not have any lanugo, and it only starts to develop after 20 weeks gestation. It reaches its peak in the mid third trimester. And the reason this is important is if you see a baby that's born and they have this fine thin layer of lanugo all over them, that means that with 100% certainty, this is a viable infant that needs to be resuscitated. Uh, the lanugo will start to th uh, thin out and uh, drop before, before delivery. So the closer they are to term, the less likely they are to have any lanugo still present. So hopefully this picture shows okay on your screen. You can see this kind of thin, fine hair. And again, if you just compare the size of the baby, so obviously this is the baby's back uh, to the size of the fingers, you can see how tiny this infant is. Uh, but despite this, this classic parent uh, picture here is Lanugo. So anytime you would see an infant born with this on them, uh, just recognize that this patient is absolutely a viable infant and would definitely be able to survive. So full resuscitation would be indicated. Uh, and again, just a very low birth weight baby, just giving you that indication of how tiny they are. Uh, imagine trying to intubate a baby that was 19 or 20 weeks, that's half the size of this baby, uh, recognizing how difficult it would be to do a procedure on a baby this size alone. So just having that understanding of how difficult some of those interventions could be. So care of the newly delivered, this was actually a lecture that I got at an EMS physician conference about a year and a half ago. And one of the things I really wanted to teach was the difference between neonatal resuscitation and care of the newly delivered. So neonatal resuscitation refers to any baby up to 30 uh, days of gestation. And that's really important because a baby who's 20, uh, 20 days old is a very different baby than the baby that's born in that first few minutes of life. Uh, when babies are initially born, they convert from being water breathers to air breathers. And really the recommendation from that lecture was to incorporate training of care of the newborn with OB education. And the reason is when you're teaching OB, if the goal is to get a baby out. So if a baby comes out, we now need to know what to do with the baby at the time of delivery. And so combining those two features is really important education. So when we look at neonatal resuscitation, do we need to indicate, uh, is it indicated? So first question is, is the baby full term? Uh, is the baby crying or breathing? And does the baby have good muscle tone? So this is not your APGAR. So if you think about it, when do you do your APGARs, right? You don't do them right at the time of birth. You wait one minute before you start and record your APGARs. So what are you doing in that first minute of life? That's actually really critical. And so recognizing that first minute is not your APGARs and it's not your typical neonatal resuscitation. This is care of the newly delivered. So your first 30 seconds, you wanna warm, stimulate, and dry. 
Uh, you want to feel for the heart rate. Um, you want to see is the heart rate less than 100? Are they gasping or apneic? You want to bag the baby. If the heart rate's less than 60, you want to do chest compressions. Now, this sounds a little bit difficult because typically in the pre-hospital setting, you guys may be in the back of an ambulance, on the side of a road, in an apartment complex with a bunch of people yelling or crying. There's typically a lot of background noise. So it's going to be really difficult to try to get uh, electrodes to stick on a, a newborn baby or to try to listen and hear this. The one thing that you can do is essentially feel the umbilical cord as it's attached and kind of feel for what that heartbeat feels like. And a really easy way to think about this is to kind of go, if you hear this, you can know pretty consistently that that's a heart rate greater than 100. If you feel the umbilical cord and it's slow, you don't need to know the actual number. You just know that this is slow and this is not normal and you need to initiate chest compressions. So kind of keep in mind, just feeling that umbilical cord uh, as it's pulsating and get a good idea of where that heart rate sits. So when we look at newborn apnea, you have primary apnea, which is very normal. So that's why the first thing we do is stimulate and typically the babies will start breathing. With secondary apnea, you stimulate them and they're not breathing and that's when you wanna do early resuscitation. So that's really the key thing is that first few seconds of life, you're stimulating them, see if they start to breathe. And if they do, that's great. Uh, just uh, my last shift in the ED, we had a, a mom come in, she was imminent delivery. She delivered within two minutes of arrival in the ED um, and the baby, you know, first kind of 10, 15 seconds uh, kind of wiggling a little bit, but really not crying, just a little bit of stimulation and warming. The baby immediately started crying and breathing normally. A very classic example of how stimulation will help those newborn infants. So post-delivery care, uh, we always want to clamp and cut the umbilical cord long. And so the reason we say long is that typically the placenta will pass on its own, but there's several times in the hospital setting or pre-hospital where that placenta may become a little too adhered to the uterine wall and the OB doctors have to assist with the passage of the placenta. Uh, if the umbilical cord is too short, then they, it really makes that delivery of the placenta difficult. So when you are cutting the umbilical cord, make sure it's long enough that it's protruding from the vagina several inches in length. Uh, the other key thing, which is different from what I was initially taught and key to keep in mind is that we wanna wait 30 to 60 seconds before clamping and cutting the umbilical cord. So there's really good data that shows that if you wait at least 60 seconds, that the maternal fetal blood flow uh, through that umbilical cord, there's a lot of antibodies that get shared with the baby from mom that really improve baby's long-term health and immune system. Uh, the nice thing about this is it gives you that first 60 seconds to not worry about clamping and cutting the cord. You're really just worrying about care of the newborn baby. So feeling that umbilical cord, getting a feeling for the heartbeat, stimulating, warming them, getting them to breathe or bag them if necessary. So again, you can definitely wait at least 60 seconds uh, without any difficulty or complications before clamping and cutting the cord. There are some parts of the world that actually wait several minutes before doing that. Uh, so you know, definitely don't feel like this is a pressure as your first step you need to do. You obviously do need to clamp and cut the cord, but your initial couple minutes can be sent on to making sure that baby is okay. So you wanna dry and warm the baby, uh, wrap them in a blanket or cap if available. And then you wanna make sure you put the baby skin to skin on mom's chest to keep the uh, baby warm. So one of the other benefits of also putting the baby skin to skin on mom's chest is that they, uh, by doing that, you release Pitocin for the mom. And so that actually helps the uterus to and contract down. So if mom's having any bleeding post-delivery, uh, putting the baby skin to skin in the mom's chest actually will help her uterus to contract and will help slow down bleeding. So it's one of the first things that they actually do uh, in OB is to kind of help to uh, naturally try to decrease bleeding by doing that. Uh, if the baby is premature or not vigorous, blow by oxygen. Uh, obviously, if they're uh, not breathing, you want to bag them. And we only need to check of glucose if the baby is not vigorous or crying. So if the baby comes out, they're crying, they're moving, they look good, have good muscle tone, you do not need to check a blood sugar. Uh, remember in newborns, your cutoff for hypoglycemia is lower. It's not your 60 or 65, it's 45. So your treatment threshold for hypoglycemia in newborns is less than 45. And your treatment will be uh, D10, five mLs per kilo. So what about treatment of a non-viable baby? So if a baby is non-viable or has already passed, you still wanna treat them like a baby. And this is something that the um, OB doctors really kind of lectured us in the ED about. And they said, you know, when, when we come to the ED for a baby that's being delivered, that's non-viable, you guys do an awful job. And I said, what do you mean? And she goes, well, we come in there and there's usually the big pink emesis basin. You guys have put the baby in that. And I kind of looked at her and I said, 
yeah, where should we put the baby? And she said, no, the baby is still a baby. You need to put the baby in a blanket and then give mom the opportunity to hold the baby. Uh, and it just kind of teaches you the difference in how we're trained. And really what she explained, which makes full sense, is that for many women, they were anticipating this baby to be their baby that they were going to have until they were um, you know, an adult. And so in their mind, this is still something that they want to grieve. And so giving mom the opportunity to at least hold the uh, baby is really important. So you still want to clamp and cut the cord, wrap the baby in a blanket, and then give mom the option of holding the baby. Uh, if she declines and you just want to secure the baby somewhere for transport to the hospital, but just at least giving mom that opportunity. All right, so next we're gonna go into some run reviews. And I want you to kind of think about these uh, key questions with each case and kind of recognize why these questions may be important. All right, first case, you have a 32 year old female. She's a G9 PH. She's 31 weeks, two days gestation, complaining of abdominal pain and contractions and reports all of my babies are born early. So she's a G9 P8 and says they're all born early. I'd be kind of concerned with that. Uh, heart rate's 150, systolic blood pressure is a little soft, 86 to 102, and an accu check of 145. She's agitated, her contractions are a minute apart, and she, uh, there's documentation that there's no discharge. So what are some things that could be going on? So what's going to most commonly cause tachycardia and a low blood pressure? So the kind of the main thing to think of is shock and then recognizing different types of shock. So is this septic shock, hypovolemic shock? Um, is she hemorrhaging somewhere? Uh, so they had great documentation of the pregnancy history. They initiated an IV, started fluids. They didn't actually check. Is anything missing? Again, that key thing is, is the baby moving? So this is one where I'm not sure they would have been able to get this information from her because she's agitated. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, but just trying to at least assess that ability for a fetal uh, well-being. So again, if you can't get a history from someone, just document this. Uh, people always laugh when they look at my charts, but if you swear at me when I ask you history, that's going in my chart. It's making very clear that our interaction with one another is not really working in a professional manner. So I always document when I'm in the emergency department taking care of patients, if they refuse to answer questions, if they're unable to because they're agitated, uh, if they're swearing or cursing or belligerent, all of that goes into my documentation because down the road, I can explain why I was not able to obtain a specific finding in a physical exam or maybe necessarily get history from them if they're not cooperative with me. So what's your differential diagnosis? So this was one where everyone really thought she was on drugs, she was maybe psychotic, did she have excited delirium? But there's a key factor that pointed away from all three of those things. So all of those things you would have tachycardia, but would your blood pressure be high or low? Typically with all three of those, you're gonna have hypertension, not hypotension. So definitely that pointed away from that as a source of what could be going on with her. So she uh, was ultimately delivered an hour and 15 minutes after arrivals. The baby's initial APGAR was one. Uh, and typically if the baby's APGARs are not good, they'll kind of speed up the recurrent ones and do a third and increase to five and then ultimately 10 by six minutes. Her drug screen was negative and she was actually diagnosed with sepsis due to E. coli, UTI and bacteremia. So she was septic and she was agitated because she was not perfusing her brain. So she was quite ill. And because her blood pressure was low, she wasn't perfusing her brain. And this is why the baby also wasn't getting perfused either, which makes sense why the baby was initially at quite needed to be quite low in the APGARS. All right, next case, 33 year old female, G1P0. She's 19 weeks gestation history of hypertension and placenta previa. Uh, you can tell her systolic and diastolics are quite elevated, a little bit of tachycardia. Uh, she's presenting with vaginal bleeding and hypertension. Is anything missing? So the main thing would be questions regarding hypertension. So when you think about preeclampsia, what we really wanna know is, is the person having symptoms? So do they have high blood pressure and this is just the normal BP or do they have preeclampsia or pregnancy induced hypertension and this is abnormal for them? So your determination of whether or not to use magnesium is gonna be really based on are they symptomatic or not? Uh, so again, that question about who would give magnesium kind of depends on your associated symptoms. If she tells you, no, I've, I've had high blood pressure for years. This is my pretty typical blood pressure, or I didn't take my meds this morning. And that's what my blood pressure looks like when I don't take my meds. That's all normal. So again, getting that additional history is key. So she was admitted to OB and unfortunately had spontaneous delivery of a non-viable infant shortly after arrival. So a little bit about plus, uh, placenta previa. 
Placenta previa is a low-lying placenta, which may partially or completely cover the cervix. It's really common in early pregnancy that the placenta implants kind of low on the uterine wall. And typically as the uterus grows and the baby grows, the placenta will move up the uh, uterine wall and away from the cervical opening. What happens with placenta previa is that that placenta will remain low and either partially or completely cover the cervical opening. As you guys can see here in this picture, it, it's very easy to see why with a placenta previa, it would be impossible to have a vaginal delivery without basically life-threatening bleeding. So patients who have placenta previa will be scheduled for a C-section well before they would go into labor to help prevent them going to labor. So with placenta previa, they would have massive bleeding uh, and this could definitely be life-threatening. So the key thing with previa is this is typically painless, uh, bright red vaginal bleeding, and it can be significant. So these patients, they won't typically have pain. They may just have significant bleeding. All right, next case, 18 year old female. She's a G2P1 at 35 weeks with syncope in the classroom. She passed out in her chair and fell to the floor. Her initial vital signs for EMS, a little tacky. Uh, GCS was initially 13 and then improved to 15 and she had a normal AccuCheck. She had a small abrasion to her forehead and she was placed in full C-spine precautions. Uh, so this case was from a few years ago before SMR, uh, but when the EMS got there, she did still have a GCS 15, or I'm sorry, 13, so she was unreliable at that time as well. So what's your differential diagnosis? So syncope is really common in pregnancy. I'm sure you guys see this pretty frequently in the pre-hospital setting, especially in Arizona in the summer. So people get dehydrated, they're not getting enough fluids in them. Very, very common to get fluid shifting with pregnancy as well. But there's one key tip off here that's a little different from uh, syncope when you think about this. In the normal pre-hospital setting, from the point of time that someone passes out, someone activates 911 and the call gets through dispatch, you guys get dispatched, get on scene. What's the person's mentation typically like after a syncopal episode? Are they usually still confused when you guys get there? And the answer I would say is most likely not. Typically with syncope, patients regain their normal mentation. The key thing that could cause this where you have a low GCS that persists and does slowly improve is seizure. So again, kind of thinking what's different about this case that's not classic for your normal syncopal episode. So the, her initial vitals in the ED were normal. Uh, she was getting, undergoing evaluation by the OB uh, physician and ED physician in the ED. And she suddenly started complaining kind of left back and hip pain. So left flank pain. At the same time, she was on the monitor and her new blood pressure popped up on the screen and she had a systolic BP of 50. Uh, the OB doctor literally unlocked the gurney and started pulling her and said, she's going straight to the OR, she's got an abruption. And everyone else was kind of standing around going, what is she talking about? How does she know this information? Uh, we didn't stop her because she clearly had a, a goal in mind and that's exactly what she did. She took the patient to the OR. Uh, she was found in the OR to have a massive placental abruption. Uh, mom needed to be transfused in the OR due to bleeding. Uh, but fortunately, the baby had really good APGARs, which were nine and nine. Uh, mom and baby both did really well. Mom went, underwent a workup for syncope, and they never found any source of the syncopal episode. So this was a case which was really kind of pretty classic example of abruption. Uh, if you think about it, the mom had a syncopal episode. She had been on the ground at the school. So when EMS got there, she was laying flat. They put her on a backboard, transported her in the ambulance, got to the hospital. She remained on her back in the hospital setting. So she had been flat for quite some time. So with the abruption, with her laying flat on her back, the blood essentially was pulling in the retroperitoneal area until she suddenly had the referred pain. And that referred pain is what tipped off the OB doctor. So the low blood pressure, syncope, and referred pain is what made her know that this was an abruption until proven otherwise. So what are some things that can cause bleeding in early pregnancy? So you can really break this down into two categories, early pregnancy and late pregnancy. So in the first uh, trimester, so first 12 weeks, the most common cause is gonna be a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage. And this occurs in uh, up to one in five pregnancies. So up to 20% of pregnancies will end in miscarriage in the first 12 weeks. Uh, ectopic pregnancy is less common, but can absolutely be life-threatening. Uh, the key difference for you guys in the field, if you're trying to figure out is this potentially an ectopic or not, is does the patient have unilateral pain? So with an ectopic pregnancy, the fetus is generally gonna implant in the fallopian tube. So the pain would be one side, so right side versus left side. Uh, in contrast, a spontaneous abortion or miscarriage, typically they're gonna have bleeding and generalized pelvic pain that's not gonna be localized to one side or the other. The other key piece of information that you guys can ask is, have you had an ultrasound during this pregnancy? 
And if you have, did they see a baby in the uterus? So typically moms will say, uh, no, I haven't had an ultrasound yet. Or yes, I had an ultrasound last week. They saw the baby. They said they saw a heartbeat. So if you're given that information, that would most likely be a spontaneous abortion versus saying someone saying, I haven't had an ultrasound or they did one, but they couldn't see a baby. And now I'm having severe uh, right lower quadrant pain. Uh, later in pregnancy, there's placental abruption and placenta previa. So the uh, classic triad for placental abruption is gonna be vaginal bleeding, uh, uterine contractions or hypertonus and fetal distress. So vaginal bleeding is gonna occur only in about 80% of cases. And this is really key because oftentimes we think of abruption as bleeding as being the number one symptom. But if they don't have bleeding, what are some other things that we could potentially look for that, help, that could help point us in that direction? So uterine contractions are hypertonous. So similar to the referred pain uh, that that uh, young lady described uh, when she had her uh, placental abruption, when there's blood inside the uterus, blood is very irritating. And so it causes the uterus to go into this kind of constant contraction state, what we uh, term hypertonus. So instead of having a contraction and then relaxing, contraction and relaxing, the uterine muscle stays kind of very tense or firm. And this is one of the things that we monitor for when you bring us patients after trauma or injury is to look and see, are they having any of that hypertonus or increased uterine contractions? A fetal distress, again, the one way you guys can assess for this is to ask mom, are you feeling the baby move? If she tells you that she is, that's very reassuring. If she says she's not feeling the baby move, that could be a concerning sign. So the hemorrhage is first gonna occur as the placenta separates from the uterine wall. And secondarily, you're gonna get the vaginal bleeding. And so depending on where the, uh, the actual abruption is in the uterus, it's gonna depend how long it takes for that bleeding to become apparent. So 20% are considered concealed abruptions, meaning that there's no vaginal bleeding because the hemorrhage is gonna pull behind the placenta. So here are some pictures where you can see uh, this placenta abruption is pretty high up in the uterus. So you can see here that the bleeding is gonna be concealed for quite some time until it starts to pull down. Uh, placenta abruption that's lower in the uterine wall will start bleeding earlier. And again, it's, if it's very higher at the top of the uterine wall, you may not see that until this life-threatening hemorrhage. So for this young lady, she was in a supine position. And so all that blood was pulling retro, uh, in the retroperitoneal region. So posteriorly for her, it's quite possible that if she had been stood up at any point during the encounter, that she may have had vaginal bleeding, but she never was actually uh, standing. She was supine that entire time. So really important to recognize that many placental abruptions will not have bleeding. Again, just another depiction about how that bleeding can become uh, delayed or concealed. So you're going to first have the hemorrhage as the blood starts to pull down, you will see bleeding, but it may not be apparent initially. So what are some causes of abruption? So you guys get a pass to play and make people participate. And there's a big hint right here. So cigarette smoking. So but, uh, people usually will throw out trauma as the most common cause, but actually maternal hypertension uh, causes about 45% of maternal uh, abruptions. So not really intuitive for many people. Trauma is a pretty small percentage, depending on the study, anywhere from 1.5 to 9.4. And this can be from motor vehicle crashes, falls, or assaults. Uh, cocaine use or any sympathomimetic, so cocaine, methamphetamine, bath salts, any essentially sympathomimetic that's going to increase your blood pressure heart rate is going to increase your chance of a placental abruption. Uh, tobacco and cigarette use, uh, younger and older age, uh, this is one of two conditions that we see more commonly in uh, younger women, so teenage girls with pregnancy and women that are 35 and older. Uh, with pregnancy, 35 and above is considered advanced maternal age. And so those two categories of teenager and greater than 35 are a little bit more common in placental abruption and preeclampsia. Uh, with African-American women, we also see a higher incidence of placental abruption. They're not quite sure why, but they do think it may relate to maternal hypertension as well. So diagnosis of placental abruption. So really the key thing is to have a high index of suspicion. So this was a case uh, when we look at that young lady with it, the OB doctor who had a lot of experience just had that high index of suspicion. So you have some type of mechanism. They had a trauma or accident and they're complaining of severe abdominal pain or their blood pressure is really high and they're having bleeding. Or you see someone that admits using methamphetamines, their blood pressure is elevated, they're having abdominal pain or having bleeding. Again, putting together those clinical signs or history is gonna be what helps point you in that direction. It's often a clinical diagnosis. So an ultrasound can be helpful if it shows an abruption, but it does not always show abruptions. 
And typically what we do in the hospital, especially after trauma, is what we term a non-stress test. And essentially with the non-stress test, what we're doing is we're putting on the transducer to look at the fetal heart rate and to look for signs of fetal distress. And then we're looking at the uterine contractions. So I'm sure you guys have seen this where when you bring a patient into OB, one of the first things they do is they're gonna strap the two parts to the mom. So they put the fetal transducer to look for the heartbeat and they usually put the belt around that's gonna look at the uterine contractions. So they're looking at two things. They're looking for, are your contractions a normal pattern? Uh, do you see a contraction that's holding for a long period of time? Because that could be a sign of hypertonus and potential placental abruption. Uh, on this ultrasound, uh, an ultrasound black is fluid. So you can see the baby here. You can see the black here is the amniotic fluid that's around the baby. This is the placenta here, that kind of gray shadowy piece. And then the black fluid here is your placental abruption. So this is one that they were able to actually see on an ultrasound. All right, next case, 33 year old female. She's G7P6 at 41 weeks, five days gestation. Uh, EMS was called by a midwife due to macrosomia and failed progression of labor. Her contractions were every two to three minutes, lasting 30 to 45 seconds. And the, uh, they state that the water has broken. So question for you guys is, are calls at a birthing center with, or with a midwife difficult? The answer is potentially, right? So some of these cases, they can be difficult. Others, they can go very smoothly. Um, one of the differences is recognizing there's lots of different levels of, of midwives. There's nurse midwives, there's uh, certified midwives, and then there's lay midwives. And so recognizing that if someone's giving you medical information, they have medical equipment on scene, this person is pr uh, pretty well trained. And if they're calling you, they've recognized that things aren't going or progressing as they should. When I did my residency at Maricopa, we actually had some midwives that worked in the hospital. And some of the best deliveries that I assisted with were deliveries where I worked with a midwife and just seeing different techniques that they utilized. Uh, the key thing to recognize is who has control on scene. So once you guys get called to the scene, you have control of that scene and that patient is now yours. That conversation can go either well or can be a little bit antagonistic on both ends. And so really one of the things that I teach people is if a midwife is trying to give you orders or tell you to, to do something or not to do something, uh, the really easy answer is to say, listen, I need to call my, uh, my medical director or base hospital to get permission because that's who by state law I have to receive orders from. Uh, it makes it very clear that you're not trying to disregard them, but you're following rules and regulations, which is to contact your base hospital. And so I think by demonstrating that, it takes that sense of frustration away, hopefully from them and from you guys to say, listen, I'm gonna call my base hospital and you guys can certainly communicate with one another if you want me to do something, but I have to follow the rules that they give me. So this was a case where uh, the midwife would recognize that the baby was born labor. Uh, and so when they arrived on, at the hospital, the patient was taken for a stat C-section because they had non-reassuring heart tones and thick meconium was noted. Their initial APGAR at one minute was four, but it had very readily improved to nine at five minutes. So this was a case where the, uh, the midwife really did the right thing. She had a scenario where she recognized things weren't going well and she called for help. And luckily because she did call for help, both mom and baby had a good outcome. Uh, one case that's ha uh, happened that I recently got, a, uh, not recently, about a year and a half got a call about was I'm on vacation and I get a call from the pre-hospital coordinator and she said, hey, I've got a question for you. We're trying to figure out what to do. And the scenario was EMS had gone to a patient's residence. There was a midwife uh, on scene and she had delivered the baby and, and was holding the baby and mom is bleeding everywhere. So mom's hypotensive. Uh, mom and the midwife say, the baby's fine. Just take mom to the hospital. Uh, so the crew kind of scooped mom up, started fluids, got mom to the hospital. At the hospital, we started getting more information and it turned out that mom had been using methamphetamine to start her pregnancy. Uh, the midwife was actually a next door neighbor who had looked at a YouTube video on how to deliver babies and had delivered the baby at home and unfortunately did not go well. Uh, the key difference was that mom and the next door neighbor had been using drugs together. And so now we have a baby who's with some neighbor who pretended to be a midwife and that was why they called me on vacation. So they called me and I said, I don't know why you're calling me. You guys need to call police and track down the baby. So luckily that's exactly what they did. They called police. They were able to track down the baby, bring the baby in. And luckily baby did very well. Uh, but recognizing when you're getting information on scene that doesn't add up. So if a midwife should have some medical equipment on scene. So if you guys get to a home and there's things there that don't make sense, 
you know, that's the scenario where you wouldn't want to necessarily leave the baby on scene, even if they're insistent, or definitely maybe call in police to kind of be there to evaluate the situation if mom's unstable. So just kind of taking a look at the entire picture and recognizing lots of different midwives out there. All right, next case, 34 year old female. She is nine days status post C-section. Uh, the patient gave her baby to her mother and went to use the bathroom. Uh, the mother noted that the patient had been gone for a while, so she went to check on the patient and found her unconscious on the bathroom floor. Upon EMS arrival, the patient was known to be altered on the bathroom floor. Uh, vitals are pretty much unremarkable with an accuracy check of 73. She was noted to have a right facial droop and GCS was eyes three, verbal two, and motor five. As she arrived in the emergency department with altered level of consciousness and right set of weakness and CT scan demonstrated an acute left MCA stroke. So she had acute ischemic stroke on CT scan. Uh, she could not be given IV TPA because she had had a recent C-section. And so she underwent CT angio with mechanical thrombectomy or removal of the thrombus and intraarterial thrombolysis with TPA. Uh, so what that means is basically they go in through the groin, they put a wire up into the vessel in the brain and they actually remove the clot from the vessel in the brain itself. And they give a little micro dose of TPA at that site of where the blood clot is. So typical uh, uh, TPA that we give for most strokes goes through a peripheral IV and it's a pretty large dose. And that TPA is gonna increase your risk of bleeding everywhere, which is why she could not have it post C-section. Uh, and the reason for the mechanical intervention and the micro dose was that they could give a very small dose right at the site of where the clot was. So she had an echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart and this demonstrated a patent foramen of valley which was likely cause of her stroke. Uh, she had implantation of a septal occluder device and I'll show you guys what that is in just a second. She was ultimately discharged to acute rehab on Coumadin and aspirin. She did have some residual right set of weakness and was nonverbal, but she was able to breastfeed, follow commands and do physical therapy. So speech is one of those things that actually does tend to come back a little bit later. And the fact that she was able to do other activities so she was able to breastfeed, follow commands and participate in physical therapy was actually a very good sign. So stroke in the peripartum period, ischemic stroke is the most common. So it's gonna occur in about 85% of cases. And you do see some percent of hemorrhagic stroke as well. So close to the time of delivery is when you'll have about 40% of strokes. Antepartum or before delivery is about 10%, but postpartum is gonna actually be your highest rate. So she was nine days status post C-section, you know, that's gonna be your highest time frame. So recognizing when you see pregnant women or patients who are postpartum, a lot of the pregnancy complications may persist even after they're discharged from the hospital post-delivery. So with the ischemic stroke, you have a clot that is either gonna travel or develop in the vessel in the brain versus a hemorrhagic stroke, which is gonna be bleeding at that side of the vessel in the brain itself. So causes of ischemic stroke, so preeclampsia and eclampsia, uh, amniotic fluid embolism, which is much less uh, common, but we do see, and essentially this typically happens during delivery, you'll have some amniotic fluid that embolizes through the vessel and goes to the brain. Uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, a choriocarcinoma, which is a type of cancer that develops in the placenta, uh, drug use, especially uh, sympathomimetics, and then any underlying hypercoagulable state or clotting disorder. Uh, hemorrhagic strokes are most likely due to eclampsia, vasculitis, which is inflammation of the blood vessels, and AVM, which is arterial venous malformation. Uh, we can develop these all over our body. They're basically a little cluster of typically arteries and veins, and these have a high risk of bleeding. You can get them in the brain, at the solid organs, liver, spleen, all over, but these will definitely increase your risk for hemorrhagic stroke, aneurysm, hypertension, and drug use. So the key thing to recognize with pregnancy is that pregnancy by definition is a hypercoagulable state. So estrogen is gonna increase your risk for, for blood clots. So this is why when patients are on birth control, birth control increases the estrogen level, which increases your risk for blood clots. Well, in pregnancy, you have a higher estrogen level and the increased estrogen level is also gonna increase your risk for blood clots. So this includes stroke, DVT, clots in your lungs, such as PE. Uh, if you have a patient who has an underlying clotting disorder and now they're pregnant, that risk is amplified. So now they already had their high risk for clotting and you've added on top of that, their pregnancy, the higher estrogen levels. So those two things do combine to have significantly higher risk for clot clotting. Uh, TPA is a category C drug, which means it's not safe for pregnancy. Uh, and the reason for this is that it does uh, cross the placental barrier. So that is one of the complications is that we can't give intraarterial or um, uh, venous uh, TPA during pregnancy. Uh, 
So patent foramen ovale is a type of an ASD. We are all born with this and it typically closes shortly after birth. So when we talked earlier about converting from a water to an air breather, that's when your PFO closes. In about 20% of the population, uh, we, the ASD or PFO does not close and we call this a patent foramen ovale. This is one of the most common reasons for a stroke in younger patients. And what happens with this, a clot will travel from the right atrium through the PFO into the left atrium and then goes to the brain resulting in a stroke. Uh, the diagnosis for this is an echocardiogram or ultrasound of the heart. You can see here Peyton Foramen Valley and how that blood flow with this green arrow, uh, you can see unfortunately what can result uh, in the blood and that clot going up to the brain. So this is the septal occluder device. So this is something that's similar to heart catheter when they did the thrombectomy for a stroke, they go up through the groin and they go into the heart vessel and they essentially deploy this device that's gonna seal off that opening. And the goal in sealing that opening is to help prevent future uh, stroke uh, and it's a much less invasive procedure. So in the past years ago, all these patients would have open heart surgery to repair this. This is now a relatively non-invasive way of repairing a PFO. So the nice thing about virtual uh, meetings is that you guys don't have to feel shy about standing up and moving around. Uh, so definitely feel free to keep moving around as much as you need to. Uh, definitely hard sometimes to sit still and look at a computer. Uh, next case, 28 year old female, she's a G2P2. She has two days postpartum spontaneous vaginal delivery. She's now back at home already and complaining of chest pain. Uh, initial vitals, you can see some tachypnea, but otherwise normal. Um, super up, you can see significant drop in her blood pressure. She had a normal AccuCheck and EKG is obtained. So what are some things that you could think of that could cause chest pain post-delivery? So we just talked about hypercoagulable state. So could this potentially be a blood clot? You've got tachypnea dropping your blood pressure. That's certainly a possibility, but this is your EKG. So what do you guys see here? I'm sure you can see pretty significant ST elevation here. So the uh, pre-hospital team did an EKG that demonstrated a STEMI. Uh, they gave her aspirin, oxygen, and started an IV, and a STEMI alert was performed. Uh, she went to the cath lab and was found to have a coronary artery dissection and 100% occlusion of her LAD. Uh, she underwent bypass surgery and had a balloon pump placed. A balloon pump is a device that's placed in the heart to kind of help support the heart function. And she was transferred to Mayo on the transplant list. Uh, but the latest update was that she actually had good recovery of her heart function and she was discharged home and doing quite well. So pregnancy and dissection. So spontaneous coronary artery dissection is pretty rare. They don't know the cause of it, but they do find that it happens more frequently in women and more commonly in pregnancy as well. They think that this is likely due to the hormone levels that occur during pregnancy. Uh, the key thing is that this typically has greater than 50% mortality at the time of presentation. So these patients will, would present either in sudden cardiac arrest or with an acute MI, i.e. a STEMI. So this case is a really good example of how our system of care here in Arizona works to really improve patients' outcomes. So this is a young woman who is two days at post-delivery. She thinks she's, you know, she's already home. So she clearly had an uncomplicated delivery. She and baby are doing well. She's gotten through. She's thinking she's healthy. Baby's doing great. And then all of a sudden this happens. Uh, and luckily she had a really good outcome based on the care and EMS rapidly recognizing the STEMI and getting her to definitive care. So lots of things that can cause chest pain in pregnancy. There's dysrhythmia, pulmonary embolism, aortic dissection, uh, gallbladder disease, which is typically from radiation of pain. Uh, we do know that gallstone issues are more uh, common during pregnancy due to higher estrogen levels as well. Uh, people tend to have more issues related to the gallbladder. As the uterus enlarges and gets bigger in size, it's gonna push in the abdominal organs, will typically push the gallbladder higher up and cause more common radiation of pain. Uh, cardiomyopathy and acid reflux. Again, as you put pressure on the stomach, you're gonna have more of that acid reflux causing discomfort in the chest as well. So you have a 32 year old female, she's a G4P2 with palpitations and chest pain. This one I included the hospital EKG just cause it was a little bit bigger to see, but I'm sure you guys can see a pretty rapid SVT with a rate of 216. So what are some other things you wanna know? So again, kind of keep in mind, what are those key questions we wanna ask? You know, is this, is this pregnancy related complaint? No, but do you think that baby's getting stressed if mom's heart rate's 216? Absolutely. So if mom's heart rate's 216, baby's heart rate's probably a lot higher. So we wanna make sure that we're asking those questions. Are you feeling the baby move? Are you having any vaginal bleeding or loss of fluids? Any abdominal pain, contractions, any neurosymptoms? 
So again, even if your presenting complaint is not pregnancy related, you still wanna ask some of those questions. So the crew documented good uh, fetal movement, no vaginal bleeding or discharge, no abdominal pain. So what is your treatment choice? So first thing I would say vagal maneuvers, right? So try your vagal maneuvers, see if that works. If that doesn't, you wanna to go to adenosine, you would do six milligrams and repeat with 12 milligrams as needed. Uh, this patient received six milligrams of adenosine and she converted to a sinus rhythm. She had a CT of the chest, which was negative for PE. Uh, her troponin or heart enzyme was a little bit elevated. So she was admitted overnight for observation. And this was her post adenosine EKG. So you can see pretty good normalization there. And just this was the pre-hospital one. You can see here, uh, there's that little slowdown before she converted. This is actually a pretty quick uh, slowdown. I'm sure you guys have seen some of those cases where you give the adenosine and there's a long pause before the creation converts back to a sinus rhythm. So pregnancy and SVT. Uh, SVT is the most common arrhythmia in pregnancy. Uh, we have an increased risk of this due to hormonal and autonomic changes. So typically in pregnancy, mom's heart rate is gonna be higher, especially the further along she gets in pregnancy. So her resting heart rate will increase. And you combine that with the increasing estrogen levels and both of those combine to increase your risk for dysrhythmia and often uh, SVT. The first thing you wanna do is try your vagal maneuver. So this was a really uh, kind of funny case for me to talk to the cardiologist about. <clears throat> so EMS documented they tried a vagal maneuver and the cardiologist freaked out and said, you can't have a pregnant woman do a vagal maneuver, that's not safe. And the OB doctor just like died laughing and said, well, what do you think the woman does every morning when she goes to, have, to the bathroom to have a bowel movement, right? She's doing a vagal maneuver. She's not gonna push the baby out with one vagal maneuver trying to convert the heartbeat. It's totally safe. So recognizing we all have our wheelhouse. So the cardiologist was very set in their mind that a vagal maneuver wasn't safe. Whereas the OB doctor was kind of laughing saying, yes, they can absolutely do this. So very safe, do your vagal maneuver first. Uh, IV adenosine is the, sorry, I just saw a typo there. It's your drug of choice. Uh, I just mentioned this, although, I think we're down to, I don't think any more agencies that will be carrying verapamol any longer. Uh, we don't want to use that due to risk of hypotension. And then the question is who would give aspirin if the patient complains of chest pain? So aspirin itself is not 100% contraindicated in pregnancy. There's actually lots of cases where OB doctors will give pregnant patients a daily aspirin. To me in the pre-hospital setting, I kind of look at what's your clinical picture. So if you do an EKG and the patient has a STEMI, would you want to give aspirin? Absolutely. If you've got someone who had SVT, they had chest pain, you convert them and they feel better, would you still wanna give aspirin? No, they're not having chest pain. Their chest pain was due to the tachycardia. So kind of recognizing what is go else is going on with the patient. So just because we have the chest pain algorithm, you still wanna kind of use your critical thinking and look at the entire patient and what could be causing their symptoms. So next case, 36 year old female, G6P5. She's at 32 weeks with gestation uh, with a history of hypertension and preeclampsia. She's complaining of visual disturbances and abdominal pain. Uh, you can see she's very hypertensive, 192 over 116, a little bit tachycardic and tachypnic, otherwise vitals are okay. Uh, physical exam, they document gravid, no incontinence or discharge, distal neurovascular function intact, anything missing. So, you know, potentially you could say if there was bleeding versus discharge, although I think they still addressed it with that. How about, are you feeling the baby move? So is this stressing the baby if the blood pressure is this high? Absolutely. So you've got someone who's got preeclampsia, they've got visual disturbances and abdominal pain. We really wanna make sure we ask, are you feeling the baby move? At 32 weeks, mom should definitely be feeling the baby move. So really important question to ask at that time. So who would give magnesium to this patient? So again, kind of thinking through, this is why we ask those neuro questions, right? Are you having any headache, dizziness, blurred vision? Are they altered? Do they feel fuzzy or, or kind of off from the normal self? All those are indications to give magnesium. Uh, so this patient was given magnesium. She did have a drug stream, which was positive for methamphetamines. Uh, her blood pressure stabilized during the hospitalization and she was discharged on blood pressure medications. All right, next case, 34-year-old female, G4P3. She is at 37 weeks with contractions and hypertension. <clears throat> this is her vitals. You can see hypertension and tachycardia, normal respiratory rate, uh, AccuCheck at 159. She reports she's had contractions all day and lost her mucus plug. Uh, her water broke upon fire department arrival on scene. A physical exam, they said positive pressure, positive contractions. So anything missing? So what are some things you'd wanna know? So again, feeling the baby move, any bleeding, 
Uh, any headache or visual disturbances? And do you look? So certainly she says she's having pressure and contractions all day. Definitely want to look to see if she's crowning or an imminent delivery. Uh, the key piece with this one is kind of seeing, are you feeling the baby move? And then asking again about any of those neurosymptoms. So who would give me magnesium to this patient? So it kind of depends, right? This is where we need to ask those additional questions. So this patient was pretty agitated uh, in a lot of pain and discomfort because she was active in active labor. And so the crew really felt that the high blood pressure and tachycardia were pain related. Uh, when she first got to the ED, we were evaluating her with the OB team. The OB doctor said, you know what? I think this is just because she's in pain from labor. She was really such an imminent delivery that we delivered her in the ED. Uh, and then her blood pressure stayed high. So at that point, it was recognized that yes, while she was having pain, now the baby's delivered, this is actually a scenario where she is having preeclampsia and she was started on magnesium and labetalol, which is a blood pressure medication. All right, next case, 17 year old female, G1P0. She's 37 weeks, complaining of vomiting and inability to see. She's a history of preeclampsia and she's on labetalol, which is again, a blood pressure medication. Uh, you can see extremely hypertensive for her blood pressure. A uh, remainder of vitals are normal. A physical exam, pupils non-reactive, bilateral pedal edema, unable to see, no fetal movement. So really good documentation from the EMS crew. So what's your treatment? So she was given magnesium and Zofran. Uh, she arrived at 1755, had immediately witnessed seizure and no fetal heart tones. Uh, she already had the mag infusing, so they started her on labetalol as well as Ativan IV for the seizure. And she underwent an emergency section and unfortunately had a fetal demise with APGARs of zero and zero. So this was a really unfortunate case, uh, but you can see how the EMS care with this case was excellent. They really did everything that they could be between documentation, patient care, notifying the ED to have all the resources available. So they have excellent documentation of lack of fetal movement. Um, the patient was admitted post-delivery. She was seen by neurology, ophthalmology, and internal medicine. Her MRI demonstrated scattered areas of ischemic injury. Her vision improved during the hospital course. Uh, and ultimately she was found to essentially have had just a severe eclampsia episode. So again, that recognition that uh, young patients are more commonly likely to have preeclampsia. This is a very good example. She was 17 and had this. So pregnancy induced hypertension is kind of your first step of high blood pressure related complications in pregnancy. Uh, so typically if someone has underlying high blood pressure and they get pregnant, they're just pregnant and have high blood pressure because they had high blood pressure before. If someone is pregnant and they now develop high blood pressure, this is termed pregnancy-induced hypertension. The real importance for this is that patients who have pregnancy-induced hypertension are more likely to develop preeclampsia. So these patients have to be closely monitored. So that difference of, I have underlying high blood pressure and this is normal for me versus something that's developed during pregnancy. Uh, also, typically we're gonna see this greater than 20 weeks. So if you see someone who's 12 weeks pregnant, and they're hypertensive, this is not pregnancy-induced hypertension. This is just someone who has high blood pressure. So preeclampsia is pregnancy-induced hypertension, and now you have proteinuria or you're passing protein in your urine. So the important thing to recognize is that to diagnose this, it's two blood pressure readings greater than 140 over 90. So in our typical pre-hospital setting, that's not very high, right? Most patients we see have elevated blood pressures. So if you see two elevated blood pressures greater than 140 over 90, uh, with any other symptoms, that is preeclampsia until proven otherwise. Uh, the symptoms we look for include headache, uh, peripheral edema, vision changes, altered level of consciousness, uh, kind of dizziness, fatigue, things like that, shortness of breath, epigastric and right upper quadrant pain. I'll explain why that is and weakness. Uh, when I was trying to find pictures of preeclampsia, one of the only things that came up was this, and supposedly this is Kim Kardashian during one of her pregnancies. Uh, all I know is that that looks really uncomfortable. So when we look at eclampsia, you take preeclampsia, so that elevated blood pressure greater than 140 over 90, and now the patient has a seizure. So that's the only difference between preeclampsia and eclampsia is that you now have had a seizure. So our goal is to hopefully prevent a seizure by initiating the magnesium uh, if patients are symptomatic. Eclampsia can be complicated by something called HELP syndrome, which is hemolysis, elevated liver function tests, and low platelets. And so the key thing with this is patients with HELP syndrome are going to be really critically ill. Our platelets are what helps blood to clot. And so if you have low platelets, you already have an increased incidence for bleeding. Uh, but the involvement of the liver is really important as well because the liver makes our clotting factors. So if your liver is not functioning normally, you're not making your clotting factors and you have low platelets, your risk for bleeding is extremely high. The reason for the potential epigastric or right upper quadrant pain is that liver involvement. So again, 
liver sitting in the right upper quadrant, if you're having issues related to that, that could be a sign of developing health syndrome. Uh, your main cure for eclampsia is delivery. So treatment of seizures and eclampsia. So MAC sulfate is really your first line treatment. So, you know, we really wanna make sure we get the MAC on board immediately if someone's having a seizure. Uh, the question comes up sometimes, what if someone has a history of seizures? Uh, they miss their medication. Well, then that person is someone that is most likely not eclampsia. Uh, one of the other key features is, you know, what does the patient's blood pressure looks like? It's not always gonna be high, but typically with eclampsia, it is gonna be elevated. So your dose for MAG is going to be four grams. We are simplifying this in the updated guidelines uh, for 2021. And that it's basically just going to say MAG four grams IV over five to 10 minutes. Uh, and the reason for that is it's just simpler to, to, remember, to kind of keep in mind just that five to 10 minute time frame. Uh, if you have a longer transport, you can certainly continue MAG at two to three grams per hour and you can do benzos for our refractory seizures. So one of the things that's come up uh, quite a bit recently is when do you decide whether or not to start benzos? So the main thing I would say is if you have a pregnant woman, she's seizing, you start your mag, mag's infusing. If at the five minute mark, you are still having seizure, you wanna go ahead and give your dose of benzos. The only thing to keep in mind is that uh, magnesium's two complicating uh, complications are a drop in your blood pressure as well as affecting your respiratory rate. And of course your benzos are gonna both have the same side effects. So just keep in mind when you're giving those medications, you wanna be prepared to at least have IV fluids running to support the blood pressure and be prepared to manage the airway as well. So MAG sulfate is most commonly used uh, for treatment of preeclampsia. There is some off-label use for preterm labor and it's used as a tocolytic, meaning it slows contractions. Uh, the reason I include this is every probably 18 months or so, I get a patch that'll be a crew transporting a patient. They say, hey, I've got this person, then preterm labor, can I give magnesium? And the answer is really no in the pre-hospital setting. Uh, as mentioned before, magnesium does two things. Uh, it can slow your respiratory rate and also drop your blood pressure. And so really we don't wanna cause more harm in the pre-hospital setting. So this is something that is used in the hospital, but they do quite a bit of monitoring when they're giving MAG for our preterm labor. So postpartum preeclampsia and eclampsia. So this can occur up to six weeks postpartum. Uh, most commonly, we're gonna see this within 48 hours of delivery if you are gonna have postpartum eclampsia or preeclampsia, but we do sometimes see this delayed. So recognizing if you go to a residence and the family gives you a history of she's two weeks postpartum, she's never seized before, and she's just had a seizure and they're altered and hypertensive, this is eclampsia until proven otherwise. Uh, complications include a clamp uh, seizure, pulmonary edema, a stroke, DVT or PE, and again, HELP syndrome as well. So next case, 25 year old female, she's a G1P0 at 35 weeks, four days, status was a uh, motor vehicle crash. She is a restrained driver in a motor vehicle crash on I-17. Again, I work at Thunderbird, so West Side facility, but if you equate this to kind of any freeway, kind of think about accidents you guys go to on the interstate. Uh, there was moderate front end damage, no intrusion. Uh, there was airbag deployment and no fetal movement since the accident. So again, kind of key piece of information that are gonna help us guide what we do in the hospital setting. She had stable vital signs. A physical exam is documented as normal. So where would you guys wanna transport this patient? So ideally to a trauma center, right? And hopefully a trauma center with a peri a level three perinatal capabilities as well. So anything missing, they really had great documentation. So they documented the key parts of the accident, uh, key parts of the physical exam. Uh, the one thing to consider, which I think we all can probably do better of as well in the hospital setting is documenting those per pertinent negatives. So with the EPCR system, uh, you know, it's easy to drop down and kind of put normal or not seen, uh, but sometimes adding in a few keywords in your narrative can be really helpful. We, you know, no seatbelt sign noted, no abdominal bruising. That helps really paint a picture. Uh, they did a good job documenting decreased fetal movement and both seatbelt use and airbag deployment. Uh, she had no vaginal bleeding as well. Uh, the patient had a positive KB stain and I'll explain why we use that in the hospital. And she was kept for, uh, for observation for fetal monitoring. So the KB stain is a Clay Howard Betke stain. So this is a test that we do in the hospital to detect fetal to maternal hemorrhage. So when you guys bring us a patient who's pregnant, who's been involved in a motor vehicle crash or trauma, this is one of the labs that we draw. And the reason is we're trying to determine the risk for having any type of uh, delayed abruption and how long we need to monitor that mom in the hospital. So if there's a positive KB stain, that there's an increased risk for preterm labor. And so typically we'll monitor those patients for 24 hours in the hospital. 
Uh, if the patient has a negative KB stain, otherwise everything looks good, mom has no other injuries, we'll typically monitor mom and baby for four hours. And if everything looks good at the four hour mark, at that point, we can safely discharge the patient. So this is just one of those tests that we do anytime you guys bring us a patient that's had trauma who's pregnant to determine how long we monitor them for. Next case, 26 year old female, she's a G4P3. She's 38 weeks, six days in a motor vehicle crash. She was restrained, airbags were deployed. She's ambulatory on scene. She states that she felt the baby move before the accident. Her vital signs are normal and there's a bruise on the abdomen. So pretty good information that you're kind of gathering. So think about those questions in your mind. So where would you take this patient? So this was an interesting uh, case scenario. So this patient, um, the accident occurred literally at the intersection of where Thunderbird sits. Um, so right there at the intersection and the patient was scheduled to have her delivery at Thunderbird. So she and her husband were very adamant that they wanted to bring her to Thunderbird. At the time of this call, we were not yet a trauma center and the crew really felt like we should take this patient to a trauma center because of the fact that she had some bruising and there was airbag deployment. The patient and her husband were adamant about coming to Thunderbird so the crew patched and got permission to bring, us, uh, bring her to Thunderbird versus going to a trauma center at that time. So the accident occurred around 6 p.m. on a weekday. Uh, they drove the less than quarter mile that it took to get around to the back of the hospital to the ambulance entrance. And by the time they got to the ED entrance, the patient was now having such significant hemorrhage that it was literally pooling off the sides of the stretcher. Uh, she went straight to OB. Uh, she had no fetal heart tones upon arrival. And she went straight to then to the OR for an emergency C-section and was found to have a massive placental abruption. Unfortunately, she had a fetal demise with AP bars of zero and zero. So she had so much bleeding intraoperatively that they actually needed to transfuse her. And the OB doctor was so concerned that there might be another injury that they called a general surgeon to do an exploratory laparotomy to look to see, are there any other injuries here? And no other injuries were found. So this was a case where the patient was just having massive bleeding from placental abruption. Uh, and that was unfortunately due to the accident. So after this case, the question came up of why did EMS bring us this patient? And so as soon as I reviewed this case, I said, well, number one, they did exactly what they were supposed to, which was they contacted medical direction and they followed the orders they were given. I said, but number two, had that patient gone downtown, you would have had a crew in the back of an ambulance with really no resources outside of IV fluids and that mom would have coded. So this would have been a you know, 20 to 25 minute transport with a baby that still would not have survived, but unfortunately a mom who potentially would not have survived as well. Uh, so really unfortunate case, but recognizing that some of that documentation on uh, no, move, no fetal movement since before the accident, again, gave you that clue in something's going on with the mom and the baby. So recognizing some of those key pieces of information that you get. Uh, next case, 33-year-old female. She is 30 weeks gestation. She is a driver on the freeway with positive front end damage. She's ambulatory on scene. She's complaining of abdominal pain and worried about her baby. Her EMS patient is, quote, very agitated and worried about baby, wouldn't answer questions. So excellent, really painting a picture, right? If you can't get information, just documenting patients agitated and I can't get information to the questions I'm asking. Uh, vital signs were normal and physical exam is documented as normal for all fields. So anything missing? So I would say, are all accidents on the freeway re, uh, equal? Definitely not, right? So think about it. If you've got an uh, accident that's on the on-ramp or off-ramp, it's rush hour traffic, cars are bumper to bumper, you may have a minor rear end that's technically on the freeway uh, that could be a relatively low risk accident. Uh, this was actually a, a different scenario. The, the pregnant woman was driving. She felt that another car had cut her off. So she decided that she was going to speed up and try to cut them off. So a little road rage incident. And they had a very high speed accident on the freeway. Uh, so this was a situation where there was a lot more to the scene, which really increased the risk associated with this baby and mom. So this was where we really didn't have the information about the type of accident, the speed, where it occurred, uh, description of injuries. So mom may not be able to tell you if she's uncooperative, if the baby's moving, loss of fluids or bleeding, but certainly if you guys are on scene, you can get a lot of the information from witnesses or PD about the mechanism. And you can also tell by looking at the vehicle, whether or not airbags are deployed. Uh, airbag deployment is really important with pregnant women. Uh, if you think about it, if someone's pr uh, pregnant, their uterus, that's gonna often take the brunt of the airbag, right? So that airbag is gonna take, uh, it's gonna hit that uterine wall and really increases your risk for placental abruption. So that is one of the key pieces of information that we look for. 
Uh, so this was a case, again, was a high-speed crash in the freeway. Um, the patient uh, did have uh, airbag deployment, and she was noted to have a seatbelt sign of bruising on the abdomen. So this is where she was actually admitted for 24 hours to rule out delayed abruption. So one of the things that's important for us is kind of knowing some of that information on scene that really helps us in the hospital make a determination of how long do we monitor that patient. So if there is airbag deployment, most of the OB docs will tend to air on at least four hours, but sometimes routinely 24 hours. And if there's any bruising or seatbelt abrasion, that's almost a guaranteed 24 hour admission. So a lot of the information you guys get in the pre-hospital setting really helps us gauge how long we need to monitor that mom and baby for. Kind of looking at use of seatbelts, one of the key things is often asking a patient or looking at them to see if when you do get them out the car, if they're still seat belted, where was that seat belt? So the correct placement is obviously having that seat belt underneath the, uh, the uterus, uh, but many people find that uncomfortable or the seat belt will kind of gravitate up. And if the seat belt's over the uh, anterior abdominal wall, that is a really risky placement. Uh, when that car is involved in an accident or someone breaks, that uh, seatbelt's gonna engage. And that sudden jerking of the seatbelt against the uterine wall can definitely cause significant injury. So kind of looking to see where they were in the seatbelt, was it worn, uh, worn appropriately? And then also, again, if you think about where that airbag's gonna hit, it's gonna go right on that uterine wall as well. So is history limited? Again, just documentation. This is something that I think is in general, with any pre-hospital call or in the emergency department as well. Uh, we see a lot of patients that may be unreliable, agitated, uh, altered, whatever the case may be, uh, just documenting the reason you can't get that information from them. Uh, we also wanna to try to document pertinent positives and negatives in regards to pregnancy. So documenting you know, no, no neurosymptoms, no vaginal bleeding, no loss of fluids, no abdominal pain, no contractions. It means you've asked all those questions. Uh, if you don't document that and then the patient turns out to have one of those things, the question is, did you actually evaluate this? So again, it's just very protective to take a couple extra minutes sometimes to put that documentation in there. So motor vehicle crashes in pregnancy. The key thing is to recognize you know, how you wanna transport these patients. So we wanna make sure that we take the patient to a facility that has the ability to take care of both mom and the baby. Uh, we wanna transport the mom on her left side. And again, reason for that is if you keep her flat, especially as in advanced pregnancy, you're gonna increase your risk for hypotension due to the baby pushing on the IVC. Uh, so definitely wanna make sure you have your mom, the mom tilted to her left side. Uh, if multi-system trauma, you want to make sure you go to a level one facility that has OB capabilities. And typically these patients are going to be monitored again, minimum four hours and often up to 24 hours. And a lot of that decision is made by the information you guys provide us from the scene and accident itself. So this was just kind of an aftermarket um, seatbelt that was put out there. I thought it was kind of funny, obviously sold in the United uh, Kingdom, not here in the States, of kind of trying to avoid having something that goes directly over that uterine wall. Next case, you have a 24 year old female. She's a G5P0 complaining of abdominal pain. Uh, she states she coughed and the baby came out. Upon arrival, uh, EMS found a 17 week fetus on the bathroom floor. So what do you do? So this was a case where uh, she had had prenatal care. She told them the that she was 17 weeks pregnant. And so the crew kind of had this baby and they called because they said, we weren't quite sure what to do. Uh, so when they called, I said, well, number one, clamp and cut the cord, uh, then wrap the baby in the blanket. And again, give mom the opportunity to hold her baby. So this is someone who's unfortunately now had five miscarriages. And so giving her the opportunity to at least have closure uh, is really important. Next case, 27-year-old female. She's a G2P0, unknown weeks gestation. She's had no prenatal care, spontaneous delivery at home. So this is unfortunately, I think, a pretty common call that you guys see in the pre-hospital setting. You've got someone who's pregnant. They don't know how far along they are. They've had no prenatal care. And now you've got a delivered infant and you're trying to determine, do I resuscitate? Do I not resuscitate? So in this case, it kind of depends on the gestational age. So the crew patched to me. Uh, I asked them to describe the baby and I asked specific questions. I said, are the baby's eyes fused closed? And they said, yes. And I said, is the kin skin kind of sticky, translucent or transparent? They said, yes. And I said, okay, no resuscitation is indicated. You can clamp and cut the cord and transport both mom and baby to the ED. Uh, when they arrived in the ED, the neonatal nurse practitioner looked at the baby and their documentation stated, unable to discern gender, gelatinous, translucent skin, fused eyes, and they estimated the baby to be approximately 18 weeks gestation. <clears throat>
All right, next case. So this is a, obviously a screenshot from the EPCR. So patient found walking outdoor of trailer complaining of bleeding that started approximately 30 minutes ago. Patient claims to have passed a large clot with onset. Patient had no crowning, but approximately 250 cc's of blood pooling in abdomen when checking for crowning. Peripad filled with blood. Patient denies any trauma. Patient was getting laundry with onset. Patient was seen in the ER approximately January 20th and told she had a tear in her placenta and was sent home on bed rest. Patient claims to have prenatal care and taking prenatal vitamins. Unknown on OB was supposed to be set up with an OBGYN. Response to treatment, no change. Status and route, no change. Still having cramping, lower abdomen, and bleeding vaginally. So really good documentation of history. Uh, key thing I'm sure you guys picked up, so a tear in her placenta. So kind of a concerning that she has an underlying placental abruption of some uh, degree. So you've got a 30 year old female, she's G3P0, approximately 20 weeks gestation with vaginal bleeding. She denies trauma, is anything missing? I would say she's, they've got excellent documentation. So they described the amount of bleeding, they evaluated for crowning. Uh, she did have an ultrasound which confirmed an abruption and a drug screen that was positive for methamphetamines. She was monitored for three days, the bleeding stopped and she was discharged because she was still in that pre-viable state. Uh, she was advised to seek prenatal care and to discontinue methamphetamine use. So same patient, uh, 30 year old female, she's now 21 weeks, five days, complaining of contractions and cramping for the last 30 minutes. She was just released from the hospital after four day stay for preterm labor. They documented no urge to push, vital signs stable and transported to AMBO for transport to ED. So uh, transfer of care. So one of the things that I would like to point out is that, you know, keep in mind if you've got a patient who's had preterm labor, she was just admitted for this and she's having contractions is she likely to potentially have a delivery and route to the hospital? So when I was an undergrad, I worked full-time in an ambulance uh, and many patients can very safely go with one person in the back of an ambulance, but I would say someone that's pregnant and potentially in labor, you would wanna have at least a second set of hands. If this patient did potentially deliver, you would want suddenly to be in a scenario where now you've got one person who's trying to deliver a baby, take care of baby and mom in the back of an ambulance. Uh, so they didn't really talk about vaginal bleeding or discharge, asking about baby moving. This is kind of that borderline time frame. They may or may not feel it yet. Uh, they did document well, no urge to push. She arrived at the hospital at 1922, delivered the baby at, at 2029, and unfortunately babies had APGAR of one and one and did not survive. All right, so next case, this was a 22-year-old female, G4P2, status post delivery of unknown gestational age baby into a toilet. Uh, upon arrival of EMS crew, the patient was holding a fetus, the cord was still attached. Uh, heart rate was documented as 70 with spontaneous respirations. The crew initiated chest compressions and BVM. So what do you do? So again, clamp and cut the cord. Do you resuscitate the baby? Again, this is gonna be trying to look at that baby and determine what is actually that baby looking like. So what are your chances of, uh, of resuscitation? So when they arrived in the hospital, uh, the neonatal look, uh, nurse practitioner looked at the baby. They kind of looked at the findings and said the eyes are fused, the skin is gelatinous, vocal cords are too small, and they estimated the baby to be 20 to 22 weeks to station and resuscitation was discontinued. So this crew was pretty upset on scene uh, and at the hospital. Uh, they had had difficulty with all aspects of resuscitation. They said it was difficult to bag the child. They couldn't get IV access. And all of that really equated to the fact that this baby was really pre-viable and much too small to try to resuscitate. So at the same time we got this call, which was an alarm room notification, uh, we got a second alarm room notification saying that we had another baby coming in that was delivered in a toilet. Uh, we called the alarm room back and said, are you sure this is two separate calls? We just have another one coming in. And they said, nope, two different addresses, two different engine companies, uh, both coming to you. Uh, so this other one, the crew arrived at the door of the hotel. They found a 21-year-old female. Uh, she stated she was approximately eight months pregnant, had no pre no care. Her boyfriend had cut the umbilical cord with scissors and called 911. Uh, he did admit that they had used heroin throughout her pregnancy. Uh, the baby's blood sugar was 36. So what would your treatment be? So it kind of depended on how the baby looks. So um, if IV access can be obtained, uh, but, it, but if good APGARs, you could potentially wait. So this was a baby who was really crying, very pink active. Uh, they had difficulty getting an IV and so they withheld the glucose, which was very reasonable for this patient. Uh, if you were able to get uh, an IV and the patient was not vigorous, uh, your treatment would be D10. And again, that's five mLs per kilo. So when she arrived, the neonatal staff looked at this baby and said, this baby's approximately 36 weeks gestation, uh, was admitted to the hospital and did quite well. 
Next case, 35 year old female, G2P0, SAB1. She's at 37 weeks gestation with sudden onset of difficulty breathing. Upon arrival of EMS, uh, she has a heart rate of 160, respiratory rate of 44 to 50, pulse sucks is 65%. Uh, she was placed in non rebreather and her sets improved to 87%. Uh, to complicate factors, she was on the third floor of an apartment building with no uh, elevator, and so they had to carry her down uh, the multiple stairs um, with her being pretty unstable uh, and being uh, over 300 uh, pounds in size, so pretty hard to get her out and manage her clinically. Immediately upon arrival in the ED, she was intubated. Uh, she went straight to the OR and was delivered within eight minutes of arrival. Uh, baby's APGARs were four, four, and seven. And mom was diagnosed with peripartum cardiomyopathy with an ejection fraction of 25% and obstructive sleep apnea. And we'll talk about the EF in just a minute here. Uh, mom and baby both did well and were discharged from the hospital. So peripartum cardiomyopathy is basically heart failure that develops around the time of delivery or during pregnancy. So it occurs in the peripartum or time frame around delivery. So it could be before, at delivery, or shortly after. This results in a reduced ejection fraction. So ejection fractions are kind of weird. 60% or above is considered normal. So we don't ever list an EF of 100%. We basically look for an EF of 60% or above. 25% uh, or below is typically your cutoff for heart failure. So many patients who have CHF will have an uh, EF of 10, 15, 20, or 25%. Uh, you have the same symptoms of any other patient with heart failure. So dyspnea or thopnea, meaning you can't lie flat to, uh, to breathe. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, where you kind of wake up gasping for air and obviously peripheral edema. Uh, we do see an increased incidence in African-American women. They believe that this is related to hypertension. And your complications for peripartum cardiomyopathy are going to be hypoxemia, thromboembolism or clot formation, as well as non-reversible heart failure. So some of these patients, unfortunately, their heart function does not recover, and they ultimately end up needing a defibrillator pace, uh, placed in order to protect from uh, kind of dysrhythmias. So big complicating factor that we see with patients who have heart failure is that because the heart muscle isn't contracting normally, they have a high rate of VTAC and VF events. So that's why many patients with heart failure end up with a defibrillator. So I've taken care of many young women over the years in ED who unfortunately have peripartum cardiomyopathy end up with non-reversible heart failure and now have an ASD or defibrillator placed for this. So a little bit about clotting disorders in pregnancy. So again, I mentioned previously, pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state. So there's lots of different clotting disorders out there that are often genetic in nature. So you know, if one family member has it, it's more likely that other family members will have this as well. And patients with the clotting disorder are much more likely to have uh, clots during pregnancy as well. It's gonna increase your risk of DVT or clots in the legs, PE, which is clots in your lung, and again, stroke formation as well. Uh, we cannot give Coumadin because it crosses the placenta. So typically these patients are gonna be managed with Lovenox. So one of the key things to recognize in the pre-hospital setting is that if you see a patient who's at Lovenox, you need to think of two things. Number one, she's high risk because she's high risk for clot formation. But the other issue is any minor injury or trauma, this patient is now really high risk for bleeding complications because Lovenox is a strong blood thinner. So kind of recognizing a patient who's on Lovenox uh, injections during pregnancy, this is a high risk patient for both clotting disorder as well as bleeding complications as well. The interesting thing that we've started to see more in the last few years is patients who have kind of recurrent miscarriages they believe that some of those miscarriages are due to uh, clotting related issues. So you'll start to see more pregnant women who are on a daily aspirin, which could be a full strength or on daily Lovenox to help prevent miscarriages. So it's something we're seeing more in the pre-hospital setting as well. So I wanna speak briefly about the Arizona Perinatal Trust. So this is a nonprofit organization that was established here in Arizona in 1980. And their goal is to really improve outcomes for moms and baby, uh, babies during pregnancy. And the participation in this program is voluntary. So hospitals choose to participate in this process and a team of doctors and nurses from another facility will come and evaluate that process to look and see what can be done to improve outcomes for the mom and baby born in that facility. They then kind of assign a level or grade to those facilities. And that's how we have our different um, OB level hospitals or NICU level hospitals. So for our NICU levels, this unfortunately the numbers are opposite from trauma centers. So a level three is our highest category. A level three facility can provide services for all OB and newborn patients, including those requiring subspecialty and ICU care at all gestational ages. Uh, so on the East Valley, Banner Desert would be your facility for this. 
a 2E is going to be kind of your next step down. It's going to be a service line for high-risk OB and newborns with some selective continuing care, but this is for 28 weeks gestation and greater only. So Chandler Regional will be the 2E uh, in the East Valley. Your level two has the ability to stabilize and transfer any baby that needs to tra uh, transfer. So this includes Banner Gateway, Banner Ironwood, Mercy Gilbert, and Malton Vista. Uh, the reason I put this in here is that not that you guys necessarily need to know what care can be provided, but just recognizing if you do have a high risk um, pregnancy or a trauma that you wanna try to make sure you get that patient to a facility that has a level three NICU as well. So one of the things after that first one case that we had with the accident that occurred next to Thunderbird, after that incident, uh, we really had what's called a root cause analysis where we evaluated the whole process and said, is there something we could have done better or differently? And so we got all the teams together and we decided, you know, historically, if you had a patient who was pregnant, the question was, well, does she, you know, she's in a car accident, she doesn't meet trauma criteria, does she go to the ED first, OB, or does the patient get moved back and forth between the two different parts of the hospital? And that is really the normal process throughout most of the country. And what we recognize is that that really delays care because you have one set of providers that are looking at one part of the baby, uh, the mom and baby, and then you've got another set of providers looking at a different subset. And so we said, how can we actually get this done together? And so we developed the OB rapid response process where essentially was set criteria pre-hospital when crews patch in, we use those criteria to determine whether or not to activate the process. Uh, and then OB, NICU, and ED all evaluate mom and baby together in the ED to determine what the next step will be. And we've had great outcomes with doing this for over seven years now. And this has actually been implemented across the banner system. I really, we were able to show improved outcomes for mom and baby by bringing all three teams together to make sure that the mom and baby are evaluated simultaneously. So pertinent questions, again, the one slide to remember from this lecture, regardless of chief complaint, again, if she's got shortness of breath, neuro symptoms, chest pain, you still wanna ask about these other questions. So are, are you having any bleeding, uh, loss of fluids, contractions, abdominal pain? Again, are you feeling the baby move over 22 weeks? Uh, this is really something they should be feeling the baby move and is critical to determine fetal well-being. Uh, the neuro symptoms, really important to determine whether or not you're gonna treat with magnesium for preeclampsia and always try to document your pertinent positives and negatives during pregnancy. Um, if history is limited, again, bad outcomes are gonna occur in some time, sometimes regardless of whether or not you did something incorrectly. So you could do everything perfectly in the pre-hospital setting and unfortunately there still may be a bad outcome. So your good documentation is really what protects you. Uh, if a patient's unwilling or unable to provide the information, just document that. So simple statement as patient uncooperative, refusing to answer questions, patient with altered level of consciousness, unable to answer question, patient in too much uh, pain, unable to answer, whatever the scenario may be, just documenting why you may potentially not be able to get additional information. So in summary, OB cases are really high risk. You always have two patients. You want to document the pertinent positives and negatives with regards to pregnancy, even if it's a non-pregnancy related complaint. Uh, pregnant patients, again, higher risk for cardiac, neurologic, and fetal complications. So keeping in mind your clotting disorders, uh, stroke, uh, PE, things that are much more likely to occur during pregnancy, and you want to maintain a high index of suspicion. Uh, even if you do everything correctly, there may be a bad outcome. And so it's not uncommon for families to take legal, legal action in these cases. So just make sure you document, document, document. And again, if mom says she's having bleeding or an urge to push, you want to make sure that you assess for any bleeding, lots of fluids, crowning or hair. And at that, I will open it up to any questions. Dr. Bradley, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So I, when you were talking about midwives and birthing centers, mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, as far as like the care and the treatment plans go, and um, anybody that works in uh, Station 4's area knows exactly which place I'm talking about. Um, we've had issues with one particular center, and they're very, this is kind of more of like a med legal kind of thing, I think. Um, they're very uh, guarded about information they like to share with us sometimes, and we understand that there's two patients that said, sometimes they say, hey, there's only a problem with mom or there's only a problem with baby, just take that particular patient, we'll take care of the other patient. What would be your stance as our medical director as far as like, you know, obviously we can only do so much in that circumstance at that time, but move, trying to move forward, should we try to keep the patients together like we typically would if they weren't at a birthing center? Or do we just kind of ignore that problem at the time 
um, just as far as trying to be, how coercive should we try to be with them? Um, the understanding that there is two patients. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in a birthing center, it makes me a little more comfortable if they are wanting to keep one or the other because they should technically have the ability to care for both mom and baby. Um, so that is, that's a less uncomfortable scenario than a home delivery. A home delivery, leaving one at home, I think is more worrisome for me, especially uh, if you don't have a trained personnel there. So I think in a birthing center, you know, making the recommendation, hey, we, we typically always like to keep mom and baby together. Uh, if the mom is really adamant that she does not want the baby to be transported, or if the baby needs to go and mom says, no, I don't want to be transported. Um, you know, certainly if you have concerns, you can always contact online medical direction. A birthing center, I would say, is probably less concerning, though, than a, a kind of a home midwife, if that makes more sense. Okay, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Any other questions? I know this is a ton of information. It's hard to do this remotely and not get to see people's faces. Normally, it's kind of one of those interactive lectures, but <laughs> we are doing our best during COVID, so. Hi. I have a question. Uh, Kevin, can, can you uh, unmute and uh, ask a question or did you want to just keep it posted? Uh, I, can, I can unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, what is our obligation reporting to the state or medical direction when uh, the patient actively is or, uh, using? Okay. Sorry, Kevin, we just lost volume. Go ahead. Oh, um, what is our obligation to report to the state if the uh, patient actively is using some sort of narcotic either during pregnancy or during delivery? So uh, the best thing to do is to um, document that in your EPCR and notify the hospital as well. So this is something that um, the hospital will typically get um, the, it's actually an OB drug screen. So it's very specific for OB patients versus your normal drug screen. And so what that does is they actually get a, your initial kind of methamphetamine opioid, including fentanyl, because fentanyl does not show in your normal opioid screen. And then if they get a presumptive positive, then they actually run a secondary test, which gets an actual level. So part of the med legal aspect of that is the hospitals have changed the type of tests that they run to get really more specific findings with this. Um, in the pre-hospital setting, um, you know, I think just making sure that that documentation is in your documentation and then notified to the hospital as well. And then the hospital should do their follow-up. But generally all infants um, and moms will get a drug screen, uh, especially if there's anything that is concerning in the pre-hospital setting. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Bradley, outside of uh, Banner Desert, do you know any hospitals that would take a traumatic um, injury of a pregnant mom if they're on diversion? Uh, is uh, it the county? So county should, let me look at the list. I believe in terms of closest geographically, I'm, gonna, I'm plugging the app, so I'm using the app to look at gotcha. <laughs> my full, uh, the level three perinatal facility. So, um, Val so the, the level three NICUs are Desert, Thunderbird, Bannon University, Phoenix, Honor Health, Scottsdale, Shea. So that would be really far, far too north for you guys. Um, and then Valley Wise or Maricopa. So Maricopa, Banner University and St. Joe's, but I'm guessing probably Maricopa would be the first one you would hit on the freeway coming from east to west. So. All right. Does anyone have any other questions about anything? Um, <laughs> here's an opportunity to talk to your medical director. I'll give you my COVID plug, which I, I did at the beginning yesterday, but I think uh, Brenda had asked me just to speak briefly about COVID. So in the emergency department, we're actually required uh, to wear eye protection and, uh, and, and a face shield for every patient encounter. And this has been in place for the last several months. Um, I find personally the face shield is just easier to wear just because the N95 leaks a little bit on me. And the nice thing is the face shield, you can just clean with a cappy wipe when you're done with a patient encounter. Uh, but we have paramedic students right now who are rotating in the ED and they have been told very specifically, eye protection is a must. So I think pre-hospital, like you know, EMS doesn't use eye protection quite as frequently as we do in the hospital setting, but with COVID and kind of reducing your risk for spread, 
uh, having some type of eye protection is really important. So I'd probably encourage that piece of it is just making sure, you know, obviously wear your N95, uh, but really any patient encounter, even if it's not, doesn't seem COVID related with the community spread we're seeing, just wear your eye protection too. Dr. Bradley, when you're uh, working in the hospital in the trauma center, are you seeing um, a lot of patients that aren't coming in for cheap complaints like COVID? Um, are you seeing a lot of patients that end up testing positive? Yes, it's actually kind of scary. So I will, you know, typically I'll kind of follow up to see, um, and sometimes I'll just see how a patient is and I go open the chart. And so now we actually get an alert that pops up on the screen that tells you this patient has tested positive for COVID. And so I've, I've had a number of patients that their complaint was chest pain that I thought I was admitting them just for like a cardiac chest pain. So this is someone who has underlying coronary artery disease that came in with chest pain and it turns out they have COVID. Uh, we've also seen that in our trauma patients as well, where that as part of their CT scans for their trauma, they show that they have kind of this weird that picture, which is a typical COVID picture. And then they do the COVID test and they're positive for COVID as well. So any trauma patient that comes in uh, has to get screened for COVID as well uh, and kind of evaluated whether or not they're going to be uh, on the COVID positive or kind of COVID pending for, for admission. So we're definitely unfortunately seeing a lot of that once unexpected. Gotcha. And you're requiring um, testing to any inpatient admission or um, anyone that gets admitted to the hospital? So that I, I don't know. I know Desert announced yesterday at the East Valley meeting that they're initiating that. Typically, uh, most of the banner facilities do the same thing. So I have to see if uh, they started that at Thunderbird as well. But I know they did announce that at Desert yesterday that anyone getting admitted is getting a screen uh, for COVID or the test. And really, the reason for that is we're just seeing so many patients that we don't expect them to be positive and they are. And so then if they're admitted to a non-COVID floor, unfortunately people aren't wearing the same level of precautions, of enhanced precautions to decrease your risk for spread. Okay, very good. And you mentioned the East Valley meeting. Um, just something I wanna share with uh, everyone out there. We uh, had an East Valley hospital meeting yesterday and we're getting a lot of reports. Um, we're getting 25 to 30 uh, reports every couple of days of patients that you all have seen in transports to the hospital. Um, that are uh, testing positive for COVID. So a lot of you are starting to see those alerts that we're emailing out. Um, we will get those as soon as the hospital sends them to us and we'll try and get them in your hands as soon as possible. So you saw that you had a possible exposure. Um, we're somewhere in the 650 range of patients that we've seen and transported. Um, we're, we're not guaranteeing that's all we're seeing. Uh, sometimes there's, there's information that doesn't get passed on, um, but we're trying to do it as much as we, as soon as we get it, we pass it on to you. Um, do those notifications help? Do you guys appreciate those notifications? Or some of you just, are they turning into spam email? Brent, I appreciate the notifications, uh, but when I get it two weeks after the patient contact, it doesn't really do me or my family any good. Yeah, and, and that's a good point, Drew. Um, we appreciate that. Um, input. Uh, one thing that we'll, 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 we'll tell you right now, especially with, as community spread it is, as it is right now, just anticipate that you're running on patients that are positive, positive of COVID. Um, right. So we, sometimes we won't get it for the, the notification from the hospital for a week. Um, they're sending them to all the fire departments. So it backs up on them regularly, um, but we will try and get it in your hands as soon as possible. And, I, and test turnaround time is increasing again as well. So as we're seeing more testing, unfortunately the turnaround time for the test results to come back is increasing a bit. So, um, you know, at, at one point during the summer at the peak, it was taking up to 10 days plus to get test results back. Uh, that time frame had kind of gone down to less than 24 hours, uh, but I'm hearing they were, they were back up into the several day mark again. And depending on where that patient goes, if they're admitted versus seen in the ED and discharged, uh, their test is run on a different priority level. So that kind of also changes the scenario. So the test is run at a higher priority level if they're in the ICU, regular admission, and a lower priority level if they're in the ED and discharged home. So unfortunately, the test times are starting to increase as well. And we're seeing that on our people that are getting tested as well um, at the Embry site, um, MCC. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking at two to three days the soonest that we're getting our test back. So, um, yeah, another thing with the East Valley meeting, they are, um, some of the hospitals in the East Valley are starting to see uh, 
increase in offload times, um, that always impacts you guys. So just be, be mindful of that. And if you deal with any significant challenges on offload times, just please communicate with EMS um, and we can follow up on that. Uh, but they're backing up in the ICU and there was a, like yesterday at Banner Bay with that four people and I see in the ED for ICU holds um, and that just backs up the ED a bit. So please communicate any challenges that you're seeing out there. We meet regularly with the hospitals um, and trying to make sure that we keep those offload times as, as short as we can. So um, anything else for Dr. Bradley, any other questions? Dr. Bradley, we appreciate your time. Thank you for uh, joining us on this call and uh, uh, Please, uh, please know that we appreciate you coming and doing these CEs for us.